Oh, to be like thee, Lord Jesus. Oh, to be like thee. As we come, Lord God, to your holy word, we recognize that it is the work of the Holy Spirit to convict, to move, and to help us to love as you have loved us. So we come and ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just convict us of your word. Teach us what it means and help us to live according to it so that, Lord, you would be glorified in all things. Continue to guide us now, I pray, in Christ's precious name. Amen. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. These are the words that we looked at last week, just the first verse of chapter 13. It opens up what we looked at is a section of chapters from 13 through 17, which is really the inner sanctum of Christ. His last words, his last actions as he spends it with the disciples. His Ministry to the public is over, and now he comes and he is preparing them and himself for what is going to be his death in only a matter of a couple hours. These words describe the love of Christ towards his disciples. A constant, persevering, selfless, giving love. He had walked with them for three years, hadn't he? He ate and drank and slept with them. And despite their failings, despite their sins, despite their lack of faith that they were walking with God incarnate, He loved them to the end, even until His last dying breath. These words also describe the fullness of the love of God, don't they? He loved them so thoroughly, He loved them so fully, that He gave His life as a sacrifice for sin that through his death they may be made right with God, and us right with God. These are Jesus' last hours, and he knows they're his last hours. He also knows that when he dies, there's going to be a time of great confusion. The disciples who had been following and listening to everything and going out and ministering and doing signs and wonders, they're going to see the Messiah crucified and they're going to stand there in shock and horror and they're going to deny him and they're going to wonder what's happened. So as we look at verses 2 through 17, we're going to see that Jesus exemplifies this love that we looked at last week. We're going to see it in a very concrete way, in a way that they would never be able to forget. And that is Jesus stoops to wash their feet. Now foot washing, as you know, was very common in the the Bible times. Reality was, no one had cars, right? (laughs) You had to walk everywhere you went. So when someone came over to your house, it was the responsibility of the home order to make sure that there was water and a towel, and when they came in, that you washed their feet, because they had just been on dirty, dusty roads, and it was the hospitality of the host. So it's a very real and practical thing in serving as someone comes into your home. And here was Jesus with his disciples. They had walked several miles. If I remember correctly, it was like 18 kilometers to get where they're supposed to be. They're undoubtedly dirty. And they arrive. The the room had been prepared just as Jesus had asked. There's a low table. There are some blankets and some pillows around the table for them to incline at and to eat at. In the corner is a shallow basin. There is a pitcher or a ewer with water. And there is a towel. But the one thing that's missing, conspicuously, was that there was no one there to wash their feet. So remember that this room was rented, so it's not necessarily the responsibility of the homeowner in that sense, it was the responsibility of the disciples. But there was no real host to do this. We also need to remember that 
washing someone's feet was considered the lowest of the low. It was only for those who were slaves or servants or for Gentiles. No good God-fearing Jew would, would, would necessarily voluntarily bend over to wash each other's feet. No good Roman would do that. They would always have someone else to do it. So the reality was, as they came into this room, everything was prepared, but there was no one there to wash. And yet, seeing that there was no one there, Jesus stoops to wash the disciples' feet. And, and I want to challenge you, in so doing, in so stooping to wash their feet, redefines the meaning of greatness for us. You remember just a couple chapters before, two of the disciples are arguing, which of us is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Which, is a, which of us is going to get the right hand seat beside Jesus? But Jesus says, true greatness is defined by a ministry of humility. True greatness is defined by a ministry of humility. And again, only being a couple hours away from being crucified, he knows and is chosen to wash their feet as an object lesson. He knows that he's about to die for their sins and that they're going to need a washing of their sins away by his blood. So everything that he's doing physically with them in bending down and washing and drying their feet is a foreshadow of the humility that is going to be portrayed on the cross as he dies in our place. So as we look this morning, we see that the Christian life must be defined as a life of humble service to one another. A ministry of loving service. So if you wanted to walk away with one statement this morning, let it be this. The Christian life must be defined as a life of humble, loving service. Now, not only does Jesus redefine the meaning of greatness, not only does he show us what true humility looks like, but I want to challenge you that he actually calls each and every one of us, if we are a child of God, to do likewise. He beckons us, he challenges us to lay aside our own personal dignity and to count the cost of what it means to serve one another. So what is this humility that is displayed to us in these verses? Well, we're told that during supper, Jesus got up and washed the disciples' feet. Now that, that should be a surprise in and of itself, because this should have been something that was first done when they came into the room, as part of the preparation before the meal, and yet it wasn't. It's also a little surprising that even though this was for the lowest of the low, none of the disciples got it in their own mind. If this is the Messiah, I, I want to serve him. But they didn't. Regardless, we see the full extent of Christ's humility in verse 3. When Jesus bends down to wash their feet, it says, He knew that all things had been given unto him. From the smallest atom to the largest galaxy, he is the master of creation. And we know from the New Testament, he is the creator of all things, is he not? He knew that he had come from the glory of the Heavenly Father and that he is co-equal with Father, or the Father. He knows that he is also returning to the Father. So there is no necessity for him to humble himself. All the glory of creation is his. He knew that what he was about to do and to give was a ransom for sinners dying on the cross. Not only did he have the power to lay down his life, he also had the power to take it up again. Where is the necessity to humble yourself to wash another's feet? And yet this is exactly what he does. Instead of thinking that it was below him, instead of fixing, uh, fixing solely on the task that was ahead of him only in a couple hours and encouraging and strengthening himself for the death that was about to happen, as horrendous as it was, he gets down on his knees and he washes the feet. 
He humbly serves. And think about it this way. He even washes the feet of Judas. The one he already knows Satan has tricked. It's not just the other disciples. He knows Judas is simply biding his time, looking for the right opportunity to betray. So he takes off his clothes, except for a loincloth, which is exactly how the servants dressed. He ties a towel around his waist. He pours water into the basin and then proceeds to gently cut the water over the feet, perhaps at times even rubbing in a few places, massaging to make sure the dirt actually came off, and then dabbing it with a towel to make sure that they were dried. Now we're not told whose feet he did first, but can you imagine how deafening the silence must have been? Here is the Lord of creation, the Messiah, the King of glory. All that you could have heard in that room was the dripping of water as it come off the feet. And they must have watched unbelievingly at first, at least, as he went from one disciple to another, doing the task of a servant. Again, the King of glory, the long-awaited Messiah, and he was dressed as a servant, acting as a slave. So that is the picture of humility that we see in Christ. But I want to challenge you that from here on, the emphasis is not on example for us, isn't it? As much as we need and, and must ponder the reality that here's the King of Glory doing this humble task, we need to look at the verses that uh, follow out of this and recognize that there is a mandate upon us as followers. We are likewise to be as Christ. From the beginning to the end, the Christian life must be seen as being defined by a, a ministry of humility and service one to another. And we can start to see that in the response of Peter, isn't it? In the first responses we see there, I, I couldn't help but reading and thinking, if I was there, I would have been just like Peter. <laughs> my act, reaction would have been, you're going to wash my feet? If anything, I should be washing yours. No, you come sit down, and I'm going to trade places. You're not going to wash my feet. Instead of rebuking him, we see the grace of Christ. He patiently teaches him. He says, one day, after my death, after my resurrection, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you will understand what I'm doing. But right now, you must submit in faith and trust. You don't understand what's going on yet, but you will. Submit and trust. In just a few days, the light of what he is about to do will make sense. The Holy Spirit will come upon them. He will walk with them. He will eat with them. You'll understand that the foot washing is more than a simple act of service, more than simply an act of humility. It is a foretaste of the cross and the reality that the King of Glory died for sinners. But Peter, being Peter, <laughs> hot-headed as he was, does what? He, he responds, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. <laughs> and then when Jesus says, you will have no part of me if I don't, it cuts to the quick, doesn't it? It, it? it must have stabbed him in the heart. Now what Jesus is meaning here, this is where we start thinking about the meaning of the text more than simply an example of humility. What Jesus is meaning here, that if I don't wash you, you are not a part of me. He's saying, if Peter can't submit to him in faith, to the simple act of allowing Jesus Christ to wash his feet, how could he ever hope to submit to the reality that Jesus Christ died for his sins? If he's not allowing Jesus to do the simplest of physical tasks, how in his pride and his arrogance is he going to allow Jesus Christ to, 
to die for his sins. If, as a servant, Peter is unable to allow Jesus Christ to wash his feet, it's nothing in comparison to what is going to happen, dressed as a servant, dying on the cross like a common criminal. What Jesus is doing is he's putting a spiritual meaning on something that would be a normal everyday occurrence, isn't he? We see this throughout the Gospel of John when he's at uh, the, the well with the Samaritan woman. They're, they're talking about spiritual things. When he's talking to his disciples, he uses their physical first, thirst to talk about spiritual thirst. Well, the same thing is going on here. He's dressed like a servant, and he says, this is an act of humility, but there's more to this there. Because he's not really worried about washing their feet. He's not really worried if they are clean. Again, the meal is already on. Rather, he's using this as a lesson to show them that their need is spiritual. Their sins would necessitate being washed by his blood. The issue Jesus was driving at was not first and foremost that they mu he must humble himself, but that they needed to recognize they needed to be cleaned. They were in desperate need of spiritual cleaning. If they couldn't allow themselves to be humbled, to allow Jesus to wash their feet, there was no hope of salvation, no hope of eternal life. So here we see the first step in the Christian life, in what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We, in faith, must humbly recognize our need of Christ. The spiritual truth that he's teaching Peter, that he tells us this morning, is that we must allow Christ to wash us with his blood. Now, what I mean when I say that is we recognize that that the shedding of blood, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. Our greatest need is salvation. The greatest stumbling block to salvation is our pride. Thinking that we're not really that bad of a sinner. I, I don't really need to know Jesus as my Savior. I don't need to be washed. A pride that says, well, I'm not really bankrupt. I don't need this religious stuff. Now, I've shared parts of my testimony before, but one of the things that I, I just want to hone in on this morning was when I was at York's house the very first time, he was sharing spiritual things for me. Well, I had had two years of university. I was not living at home, and I thought, well, I don't hate God, but who needs this religion stuff? I've got psychology, I've got sociology, I've studied political science, so I, I was coming back with worldly arguments just saying, I don't need this, there's no real reality for me here. But he patiently brought me back to scripture. And the biggest hindrance was my own pride, to know that I needed Jesus, because in my life I thought everything was fine. And so as we think about others around us, they may ne not necessarily hate Jesus Christ. They may not have any problems or concerns with the church itself. But simply, they don't recognize their need. And that is an issue of pride. And our task is simply to continue to prod, to poke, and show them how in desperate need they are. Now if you're here this morning, and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior... The only question you need to recognize or to, to wrestle with is, are you humble enough, are you broken enough to recognize your need of Christ, that you need to be washed of your sins? Because without being totally broken before God, there is no hope of eternal salvation. Jesus says, if I do not wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. Because it's our pride, it's our self-reliance that we stand on. And when that is finally stripped away, 
when we look at what is deep down inside of us and, and the motives that, that we're working out of and following, we should loathe our own self-centeredness, our own sinfulness. And as we come to Christ and find in that brokenness the mercy and grace of God, I want to encourage you, your sins will be washed away. You will be made right. And you will have a part of the kingdom of God. I want to encourage you too, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, everyone here this morning who professes to be a follower of Jesus Christ has gone through this. All of us at one time or another have had to face the darkness of our sin and said, I need Christ to wash me of my sins. You are not alone. We have all at one point been broken and lost before him. And that is the start of the Christian life, isn't it? A humble recognition of our hopelessness and a need for Christ. But Peter didn't stop here, did he? Christ wants to teach more things. Peter's response is, well... <laughs> If you're going to wash my feet, wash all of me. My hands, my head, basically, just dip me. Wash all of me. Again, we see the patience of Jesus. Because his words are somewhat confusing, and we're going to unpack them a little bit, but this is what it says. The one who has been bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Now, the not all of you is obviously referring to Judas, and we'll come back to that in a couple minutes, but let's take the majority of that sentence and just take a, a quick look at it. To understand what's going on, we need to understand what happened in that day and age in terms of washing feet again, because if we don't understand the custom of the day, we're not going to understand the spiritual application that Christ is making. It makes sense, doesn't it? You need to know the custom. So if you are going to someone's house... If you had been invited to go and eat, it was your responsibility to bathe yourself, to wash yourself fully before you left. But because the roads were dirty in the Near East, because you would be walking, you would get your feet dirty. So as you come to the house, that was the responsibility then again of the guest to make sure your feet are washed. The point Jesus is making here is he's saying, once someone has been washed by Christ, once someone has been bathed in the grace of God already, once you have been born again, once you are a Christian, there's no need to be washed again. You're washed once and that's it. And it's the righteousness of Christ that does that, isn't it? Once a person has been cleansed of sin, he is considered clean. Not because of our own righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ that has come to us. But here's the problem. We still need a regular foot washing. We still need to come to Christ on a daily basis to know the forgiveness of sin. We live in a sinful world, don't we? And we're going to walk and we're going to do things and just by being in the world we're going to have dirty feet. And we need to come to Christ on a daily basis and ask for forgiveness. We're still wrestling with sin. None of us is perfect. So there are going to be things that I do today and tomorrow that I need to come to Jesus Christ. So while I am saved, while I am a Christian, that truth, that reality doesn't change. I am cleansed once and forever. There is a daily need of coming to be washed again. To know that the conscience, my conscience is clean from guilt. And I can stand before God. So P Jesus has taken the physical act of foot washing now and applying all of these spiritual meanings to it. Once we have been justified before God, once we are made right with Him, nothing more can be done. But in terms of our ongoing growth in godliness, in terms of our ongoing experience of holiness, what we call our sanctification, right? Our growing in our experience of God and holiness. When we get our feet dirty, and we will, we need to come to Christ. 
we need to have him wash your feet. In the last hours of the cross, this is how Jesus decided to show them what his love means. What true love is as a humble servant of all. But think of it this way. He's given them a theology lesson, not simply washing their feet. He says, I'm on my way to the cross. You don't know what's going to happen or all it's going to mean, but I'm giving you enough of a theology lesson that you will understand that you will and have been washed in my blood when I am resurrected. They, they don't know now. How could they know now? Jesus says you will only know on the other side of his resurrection. But until that time, he wants to give them all assurance. Remember from last week, he wants them to know in the darkest hours of confusion that are about to happen, that he loves them. He is demonstrating beyond a shadow of a doubt here, his love for them and the forgiveness of their sin. So the greatest expression of love in verse 1 that we looked at, that he loved them to the end, is that he could pay the penalty for their sins. And if they put their faith in his sacrifice for their sins, they would be cleansed from sin. They didn't fully understand it yet. They didn't understand that he would have to die as a servant on the cross of a thief to make this all happen. But in the simple lesson of washing their feet, He's showing them what is about to happen and the spiritual meaning of it all. So humility is not only the starting point of the Christian life. In verses 12 through 16, we see that it is also the necessary mark of an ongoing walk with God. The Christian life must be evidenced by a ministry of loving, sacrificial service. And we see in these verses, Jesus commands all who are his disciples, I've given you an example, follow in my footsteps. He says this, If if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, this word ought in the English of the ESV that we're using is not simply a suggestion. This is not Jesus saying, you know what, this would be good if you did this every once in a while. This word odd is actually translated in other parts as a debt. He's saying, if you are a part of me, there is a debt outstanding. How is that paid? In loving service to others. Following in my footsteps and living a humble life. There's a force of a moral obligation upon us. If we call ourselves Christians, if we claim to know Jesus Christ and that uh, our sins have been washed away, then we must live on a daily basis this loving, sacrificial service one to another. If I have done this to you, you must do this to one another. The exact words of Christ. You must wash each other's feet. Not just once in a while, The full meaning of of, of the the, the wording that's going on here is that you must do it continually. You must do it regularly. This must be a pattern of your life. The emphasis is on an ongoing truth that is lived out. Now because of the force of Jesus' words here, there's actually a few Christian groups that understand that this is the start of a new ordinance. You know, ordinance is two of them we follow. Communion and the Lord's Supper, or sorry, and and baptism, right? Lord's Supper and baptism. But there are a few Christian groups, knowing the strength of Jesus' words here, say, well, we also include foot washing. But I, I want you to notice, Jesus says what? Do what I did? No. He says literally, do like a foot washing, but on the attitude of humility, that must characterize everyone who calls. Live and serve humbly. So this isn't necessarily, this is not a right of, of of the church. 
This is a moral obligation that comes upon us. If we love Christ, we must love others. We must live, put away our dignity, our pride, and say, I am going to serve this person. So what does it mean to serve humbly? The thing is that there must be a willingness. We live in a culture that or is set up on the reality is that we go out and we find everything that we need and, and then we go ahead, whether it's a home, we strive to fill our own needs. But the recognition here is that we are to call or, or the needs of others as more important than ours, aren't we? We are to not focus on our needs, whether they are real and pressing needs, it doesn't matter. We are to look at the pressing and real needs of others around us. Now, has anyone ever had dim sum? You ever had dim sum with a table of Chinese? You'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I love the Chinese church when you go out to dim sum. When you go out to a, a Caucasian or, or, or a regular restaurant, what happens is you order your meal, it comes to you, you have a plate, and, and that's your own. <laughs> but when you come to a dim sum restaurant, you share, and there's a big rotating table, is there not in the middle, a, a lazy Susan we call it, and you share. More importantly, someone starts cutting up, they have scissors, they take out the scissors, they cut it up, and they start serving you on your plate. But this is where it goes one step farther. Their willingness to serve one another is amazing. As soon as your little cup of tea starts getting down to the bottom, Someone stands up and serves. And they'll go all around the table. And if there's something left for themselves, then they'll pour their own. They will look at their own and say, okay, well, I need tea. Well, then their first question is, who else needs tea? And they will serve. And I'm blown away as I'm sitting at that table every time their overwhelming desire and willingness to serve others first. But that's just not our natural default setting, is it? But it's a wonderful example of a willingness to recognize, to see the needs around you, and to serve them first. I want to encourage you that there needs to be a selflessness about this. Again, Jesus is in his last hours. He is going to experience excruciating death. And while he may not fear death, the reality is, he will still not quite understand what that's going to mean in terms of the physical death that we know. So it would be very likely and possible for him to focus his last hours in preparing himself spiritually for that, and yet he stops and selflessly serves those around him. Instead of focusing on the glory that was ahead of him, he bent down and washed their feet. To serve time, it means energy. It means being alert to the needs of others around us. It means not worrying about what people think of me when I go to do this. It means I, I, I'm a prestigious member of the community, and, and what would people say? Where is my dignity in this? Well, selflessness says there is no dignity in this, is there? I'm simply loving as Christ has loved. There's got to be loving kindness. Jesus knew the real, disciple, the, the real needs of his disciples in the hours that were about to come. And he serves them. Not because of anything inherently good in them, but simply because he loves them. We need to give and love generously. Not just what we can afford, not just in the time allotted to us. And here's the challenge. is We live in a very busy world, right? Everything has time values. You have work responsibilities. You have family responsibility. When you get a couple minutes to yourself, you'd love to be able to sit down with a good book, watch a show on TV, read the Word of God and pray, hopefully. But the reality is there's something that we think we need, and yet we need to think of others. We need to recognize that being selfless will demand time and energy. We need to think about what this means continually. Because again, verse 17, 
has this ongoing aspect. This is to mark us as a character trait as followers of Jesus Christ. This is not something that I do once in a while. Not something I can simply plan and say, well, next month I'm going to do something that is loving and kind and selfless. It is saying that today something has presented itself to me and I'm going to serve. Again, it's our normal way of living to be marked by sacrificial service. I also want to encourage you that it needs to be impartially. When Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, the devil had already put it into the mind of Judas to betray him. So as Jesus is washing and drying his feet, there's 30 pieces of silver burning a hole in his pocket. As he is washing his feet, he knows that Judas is looking for the best opportunity to betray him. And yet he does it lovingly, just like the others. Now, the family of God is very diverse, isn't it? <laughs> there are some people that character-wise, we would not necessarily gravitate as our best friends. But the reality is we are all family. We are all to serve each other. And while it may be easiest to serve those people I know over there, we've been friends a long time, or we get along very well with them, to serve sacrificially would be easy, but to serve impartially means that we are to look upon all the needs of the body and say, I'm going to help in the same way, everybody. I'd go even as far as to say the example of Jesus Christ is that we are to serve humbly all people, even if they hate God. Judas was about to betray Christ, and Christ washed his feet. I think for me the example is while first and foremost we are to love one another and serve one another, I also serve this world. And in serving humbly in this world, people will come to know Christ. Our sacrificial service makes Christ real to the world. Now, all of these things can only be done if our heart has first changed, correct? It's not part of me to give sacrificially, to give uh, lovingly, to give impartially, to give generously, to give continually, to give willingly, selflessly. We can only do it if Christ has first changed our heart. But I also want to encourage you, it is impossible to do this if we are not feeding upon Christ on a daily basis. If I am not having my will and my mind changed by the Word of God and, and coming to, to Christ, praying on a regular basis, it, it's like having your true north set every day. If I'm not coming to Christ and being fed by the Word, I, my natural default setting is partiality. It is to love only those who I get along with. And so we need to recognize it starts with the heart change, but there's a human responsibility every day to come to Christ and to say, how can I serve the body? How can I serve as you served? Well, there's one other thing I think is typical and what we need to understand what's going on here. Because the more I read these verses, I see a relationship between Christ's teaching, the spiritual reality with the physical washing. I can't help but believe that as we need to come to Christ and have our feet washed on a daily basis, and then he says, you must likewise go and do to others, do as I have shown you, that he's not talking about us being a blessing to one another. Well, we know in verse 17, very specifically, it says, if you know these things and do them, you will be blessed. First and foremost, I think that that means that as we do them, we will have an unquenchable joy. That we will find ourselves rising above the problems of our time, rising above the problems in our life and our family. And we serve, and then we receive joy and contentment out of that. A deep abiding oneness of God is ours 
as we continually, lovingly, sacrificially serve one another. I also believe, though, that as we forget about our needs, as as real, as important as they are, when we focus and serve humbly others around us, they are likewise doing that, and our needs will be met. Does that make sense? It's a difference of saying, I have these, these needs and these spiritual realities, and they're right, but the difference is, am I going to try to find the quenching, am I going to try to find uh, the, the, the fulfillment of all this, or am I going to try to serve others so that they may find Christ, and likewise, they may serve others? The difference is whether it's me-focused or others-focused. And I want to challenge you, that that is, I think, part of this blessing as well. But here, I think, there's also something else. If we need to come unto Jesus Christ on a daily basis to have our feet washed, and if we are to lovingly, sacrificially serve one another, is it not possible that in my sacrificial service, not only is Christ glorified, but others are encouraged to follow likewise? that they're built up in their faith, that they're strengthened in their resolve to live for Christ when just a day before they were thinking of suicide, when they might not have thought, well, what does it mean for me to, to love the body or the world sacrificially as Christ, and yet you have demonstrated to that, and so you are being used by God. And I want to say one step farther, you are potentially being used by God in the ongoing holiness, the experience that they are growing in. Not only do they see the loving kindness of Christ working out in your life as you serve, but they likewise now are spurred on to holiness and sacrificial service. So I I think there is a reality that God uses us to sanctify one another in our commitment and our service to live for Christ. And that's important. Because we're not loners. We are a family. We need one another. We are not called as Christians to be individuals. We are called into a body to live, to love, and to serve. I often say when uh, we're having um, premarital classes, the man or the woman that you're about to marry will be your biggest blessing, but will be also be the biggest whetstone in your life. You know, a whetstone in sharpening. They will know every aspect, good and bad, of your life. And they will become an instrument of sanctification as they come to you and say, you said that with harsh words. You're not loving. And we come back and we don't like this, but the reality is is they are being used in our ongoing experience and growth and holiness. And I think that happens within the body of Christ. As we lovingly, sacrificially serve one another, We will find joy, we will have our own needs met, and we will see others grow in Christ. If Jesus gave to the utmost without regard of his own personal dignity, we must learn to do likewise. If as a servant, or if a servant is no greater than his master, who are we to think that we should not be serving like Christ served? We must follow the example. The Bible assumes that we're not always going to get along together. Did you ever thought, thought of that? The Bible assumes that we're not always going to like each other. Why would there be so many verses? Love one another. Serve one another. Because it's not our default setting. There is a reality that even this morning, we may have hindrances, blockages from serving somebody in this church. Maybe it's somebody in your pew. Maybe it's somebody sitting behind you, in front of you. Could it be that you have said, well, I I love them as a brother in Christ, as a sister in Christ, but I'm only going to love them to this point. Uh, I'm not going to sacrificially say, well, they're going away. I need to look after their house for them. Could it be, well, I've known them for 30 years. Um, they gossip, they lie, whatever. It doesn't matter. The reality is I've known them intimately and, and I'm just going to keep some distance from them. Is there a reality? Is Have they hurt me in the past? Am I not going to serve them as Christ served 
because there's this latent fear of hurt. We are all called to love, to serve, boundlessly towards one another. The same love that Christ showed Judas' feet. Again, the bag was jingling. Judas was moistening his lips, just waiting for the opportunity to give the kiss. But Jesus served him. When Christ washed the feet of the disciples, he gave us a great example of humility. But more than that, he calls us to follow. It is the start of the Christian life to humbly recognize that we need Jesus. It is to be characteristic of our whole walk with God, a moral obligation to love one another. It is the majesty of Christ displayed in this servant humbleness that needs to oblige us to recognize the needs of others around us over our own needs. I just want to throw in one last thing here, because I, I, I see Peter, and I can't help but thinking how much I've been like him in the past. It's one thing to humbly serve another. It's another thing to allow someone to humbly serve you. He was saying, Jesus, I don't want you to wash my feet. As we were raising support from Be Missionaries, we saw little old ladies on fixed pensions who could barely pay their bills, and they were giving us $20 a month for support. And that cuts to the heart. To know that they're giving out of their might, they're little. And we would want to say, no, you keep that. You make sure that you've got tea and you've got jam and you can pay your bills. It's another thing to sit back and say, well, Lord, I, I'm going to allow them to serve and to bless in that way because that's how they desire to serve. And so I want to challenge you that mutual humil humility goes both ways. We are called to serve and be served. And it's much harder at times to be served by somebody who you hold in great respect and allow them to do the most menial and dirtiest of tasks for you. That is the life of Christ. That is what we are called to do. Christ's love is displayed in all its majesty as he kneels and washes the disciples' feet. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. You not only give us spiritual truth that we can chew on for years to come, but Lord, you give it to us in ways that, that bring life that interact with everyday activities, that we can understand what regeneration is, what sanctification is. The work of Christ on the cross is put into a very real daily occurrence. And we thank you, Lord God, that Jesus did not believe that it was, that your glory was something that he was to aspire to nor rob. He recognized the fullness of the glory and the majesty that was his, and yet he served. We thank you that he died on the cross. And we thank you that through his death, through his resurrection, through his glorification, you make us yours. Your love toward us is seen on the cross. Your love toward us reaches us from the cross. Your love toward us is to spur us on from the cross every day until you come again. May it be so, Lord Jesus.